Welcome to the Ajvana Podcast, where we illuminate subjects in the IT infrastructure space. Get ready to hear some amazing insights from outstanding individuals that will change the way you think about IT. And now, here's your host, Mark Teeley. We're live. So, Alistair. Mark. Welcome to the program. This is another edition of Edgevana's podcast with Mark Teeley, your host. And today I'm joined by Alistair Kroll, um, a true man about town when it comes to technology <laughs> and thinking beyond the what's in the box and what does the box do when you connect it to something else, kind of, kind of stuff that I'm smart enough to think about most of the time. Alistair really takes it to that next level. And so I'm really excited about having him on the show and and talking to, through some of the topics that we've looked at. Alistair, uh, give the audience a little bit of um, background on you and what you're doing these days. I, I mostly talk about big ideas just so I don't have to worry about plugging in the cables. Um, hi, Mark. So uh, I guess I've known you since the Cloud Arati days and Cloud Perfect. Connect and Interop, the Enterprise Cloud Summit. Yeah. Uh, lots has changed since then. Um, I've got less here, you've got more, you know. Um, but uh, no, mostly these days, uh, I wrote a book called Lean Analytics that got picked up by uh, a lot of people because it was a very simple book. Uh, the whole lean startup movement, which I've been a part of, was fantastic, but it was very aspirational. Uh, lean Analytics is more like Bob Ross, you know, here's how to paint a tree. Uh, so people like that. Uh, and then that became a course I taught at Harvard Business School called uh, Data Science and Critical Thinking, which was really how to get people to think more critically about data. I also launched and chaired Strata for 10 years, which was O'Reilly's big data conference. It was a blast. I uh, founded a conference called Forward 50, which has become the world's biggest conference on digital government. Uh, once upon a time, I did honest work before all this conference stuff. Uh, I used to, uh, I founded a company called CoRadiant, which was eventually sold to BMC, uh, along with some great friends. Uh, not, I didn't sell my friends to BMC. I founded the company with great friends. And uh, that whole TrueSight product line uh, so my background is like network product management stuff. And these days I spend a lot of time thinking about how technology, uh, how the technology of, of what we're creating kind of hits humanity. Yeah. Well, and that, and that's a, that's a huge topic and one that uh, I enjoy uh, poking around in. I don't uh, even uh, consider myself anything approaching an expert, but I love um, uh, trying to debate the comments made by folks like Elon Musk or somebody on the other side of the coin where they're saying there's no risk at all. And, and um, I even, you know, I, uh, this is odd, but I have a really, really good friend who um, I've known, uh, we met when our kids were both in preschool and we've stayed friends ever since. And um, <clears throat> he's, I'm not going to say the companies he's involved in, I don't want to get him in trouble. All, I, all I'm going to say is he was working on a really, really big AI project for a very large organization. And he actually became fearful of what they were building and decided to leave the company as a result and go somewhere else. Um, and so, the, you know, this is a, a real thing and it's something that um, needs to be discussed and needs to be covered. And I, I wouldn't want to propose that I know the answers for how to, keeping, how to keep governments in line and how to keep the one person from letting the cat out of the proverbial bag because there's an advantage at the moment. But um, uh, that's what I wanna get into with you. So, you know, you, you proposed this topic, which I think is fantastic. Um, uh, and I'd never even seen this word before, but the epistemic crisis in democracy and society. And I was hoping we could link that to tech. And you said, sure. yeah, dumb, Mark. That's yeah, a nice exactly light, light simple topic, like epistemic right. crises, sure, why not? Right. So, you know, tell me a little bit, you mentioned earlier that um, language uh, ends up becoming tech, you know, tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that. Let's sure. Get... So, so epistemology is really the study of how we know what we know. And I think the crisis that we're in right now is that we as a society, and this is true across, you know, I live in Canada, but it's true up here as well. Um, we used to uh, disagree on things, but we knew what we were disagreeing on. We might disagree on reproductive rights or climate change or whatever else, but we knew that that was the topic of, dis of discussion, right? Um, in recent years, we've lost our ability to reach agreement. Like we've lost, because agreement is based on shared context and shared facts and technology has delivered us a, a platform to, to reinforce our own facts. The technologies that we have, and this has been heavily trod uh, by documentaries like The Social Dilemma, so I'm not gonna get into those too much, but let me set the stage. Um, 
Stegosaurus, right? You didn't think I was going to go with dinosaurs, but let's go with dinosaurs. Stegosaurus lived 155 million years ago. It's a long time ago. Tyrannosaurus rex lived 66 million years ago. It's not quite as long, but we think of those two things as the same. But the dinosaurs were on the earth for like 100 million years, right? In fact, T-Rex is closer to us than it is to Stegosaurus. That's kind of yeah. weird. Homo sapiens been around for like 300,000 years. What I would describe as Homo connectus has been around for maybe a couple of hundred years tops where we've started to scale language. Um, and we've pretty much burned the house down, right? So I think that technology begins with language. There's a lot of very smart people like uh, Bob Sapolsky at Stanford, um, like, you know, uh, Hofstadter who talks about chunking and memory. All these people think that language is instrumental Language is technology. Language is how we think of like what's in Mark's head right now, or uh, what will tomorrow be like, or what were the rules we set down yesterday. Um, and early on, language was pretty simple, right? We just had Homeric epics, and Homeric epics were actually written by a bunch of people. We just turned them into song and stuff. But once we got the ability to scale language, things really took off. Uh, we we created printing presses, and that became language became this time and space machine where I could write down like when to plant the crops based on when the the planes flooded, for example. I could write down a law, and then when you broke it because you'd agreed to be bound by the laws of the society you're in, you knew what the the consequences were, and so that allowed voting and referenceability and stuff. And then it really got crazy because in the 18th, 19th, 20th century, we kind of got very mechanistic with Descartes breaking things down into bite-sized pieces with the org chart that put humans into boxes with mass production that allowed us to make millions of things as long as they're identical. So now we had broadcast. It wasn't just, I'm gonna write something down. It was, I'm gonna push it out via radio or whatever. And if you look in history at the moment of the printing press, if you look uh, and, and reformation, if you look at the moment of broadcast media, we went through like, paroxysms of, of adjustment as a society, because these were new things that didn't exist before. And more recently, we now have the internet. But when we started with the internet, it was this interesting idea of, I'm gonna ask a question, I'll get an answer back. So that was kind of uh, converging us towards a common norm because I could go Google something and get the responses. Once social media came along, I told the internet about me and it gave me stuff tailored to me because that was good for advertising. And as a result, we went from broadcast TV, where you have three channels and you can choose what you want. And not to say there wasn't fake news, you know, we were still faking the Spanish Civil War and all this kind of stuff. You still had uh, crazy nutbags like John Brunner, the guy who ran radio broadcasts out of Mexico to teach the world about weird impotence treatments. Like this stuff's been going on for centuries. But once we got social media, we had two factors. First of all, we had this sense that the cultures that we were used to were now global. So you might say something to your friends at home and it'd be no big deal, but someone somewhere is going to be offended by everything you say. So we've connected us all to one another and found out we actually don't like each other that much. That's the first problem. And the second thing is by telling the internet what we're interested in, it pushes us content that's relevant to us. So every one of us has our own newsfeed. And so I think that this, and there's, there's some great examples of this. There's a, a website called ThereTube where you can go and see what you would see on the internet if you were a fruitarian or a flat earther, and it actually shows you their YouTube channels. They're totally different, right? So I'll end it with that kind of first rant, which is that we've we've gone from technology through to language that has now had a socially cooling impact on freedom of speech because we all want to conform to the norm because we know what cultural standards are and they're changing very quickly, but also because um, we are all being fed a, um, a version of something that's tailored to us. And it seems like, oh yeah, big deal. Someone doesn't like you on Twitter. But you, if you live in China and you're on WeChat and you get taken off WeChat, you lose income. You lose the ability to file taxes, to order dinner, to pay your rent. Like deplatforming isn't just like now you can't have candy. Right. Deplatforming de in the modern world is you can't get a job. And so yeah. we are now these digital hybrids. We're these chimeras of half digital, half analog, whether we like it or not. And the consequence, we have very few digital rights that are enforceable. And I think that that's the first problem is that this epistemic crisis comes about because we're, we're cooling free speech. We're um, giving people their own pockets of alternate facts that they can cite. And we are doing this to a digital doppelganger whose rights are unclear and that we're only now realizing we're stuck with for life. Yeah, yeah. So, man, you... you raised a whole bunch of opportunities for questions. Uh, and uh, ironically, I'm going to start with one that seems a little bit in left field based on where you um, 
where you took us, but I want to I want to see how you pull it back. And that's uh, one of the one of the accidental truths about where we've been going with language for the last you know ten thousand years since there were different languages that people recognized and attempt to communicate with each other through has been that we've been consolidating those languages, either through destruction of a culture or by necessity because the culture that had a specific language wasn't big enough to continue to support it in business or whatever. And that to some degree continues, we, we lose languages on an almost daily basis, right, across the world. Um, technology loves standards. And yet culture and language they're distinct and hard to understand for those reasons, not just because the words are identical, but sound different based on somebody from China saying the same word that you would say, or that I would say in English, but the culture and history associated with that language are a huge part of it. How do you see that um, being potentially protected or accelerated by technology? Well, uh, the first language I wish I knew is Mandarin. The second yep. I wish I knew is Python. So the first thing is, I would push back and say, we have created a ton of new languages. Uh, R, Ruby, yep. Python. Go. Those are all very real languages, plus right? Plus C, yep. So, so I would say that that's the first thing. The second thing is the rate at which language is modifying and changing um, from emojis to, yep. you know, roful, lol, silly shortcuts like that. Uh, yep. I was just watching Californication, watching Hank Moody rail against the use of the word lol. Um, I think that language that, that we're getting to fewer languages, but a faster pace of change. And in many ways, your your cues, because we're communicating non-verbally with, with text and so on, your cues for in-group belonging, knowing a certain thing. Like if I say to you, BTS, what does that mean? What's BTS? I don't even know. Largest Korean boy band on the planet, hundreds oh, of right. millions of fans. I just learned that this weekend from right. my niece. There you go. But See? but like, forgot, if you didn't know I that, you miss context right and so so the first thing is i think language is context and when we get to fewer languages we have um, more context but there's so many pockets of context i could show you an article written by a, a paper from across the political aisle that would contain so little context for you it would be almost impenetrable yeah. and so i think that um, we are reducing the variety of languages by definition, technology done that, but we're increasing the number of pockets where people get to hang out and, and think their own thoughts. Okay, well, uh, there there is so much to unpack with this one. I'm gonna have to take it to the next topic just because I'm worried that we would spend only on this first first third of the of the topic. Um, so, you know, we talked about language and, and, and how that is tech, not just getting to tech, but how it, it literally is the, the origin of tech. Uh, what about the difference between the, the beginning history of, of humans using tech versus now it's more of a combination of tech using humans or, or at least tech, because you, you already described it in one way where you talked about us being chimeras. Uh, you know, how, do you, how do you see that, that continuing? Well, I think that um, humans, mostly, mostly our relationship with AI is it's something used on us rather than something used by us. And I think the next decade, we're gonna see legislation where we have technology used by us and we have the right to an agent um, the fact that, you know, I can't subpoena your lawyer, but I can subpoena your cell phone is kind of weird when you think about it, right? Like what knows yeah. you better than your cell phone? Um, so right. I think what's happening here is this. Um, when I used to wake up and program on my Apple II computer, I got a little blinky square bracket and I could just start writing code, right? I told the computer what to do. Today, I wake up and I look at little red dots and they tell me what my day is gonna be like. I am ruled by a series of small red dots on a little tiny rectangle. That's weird. And yet I yep. have, you know, like the frog in the pot, which actually doesn't happen, but like that analogy, I kind of woke up to it and that's, I'm just okay with that. Here's the difference. For the first time, we are able to speak to the collective consciousness of humans and have it answer back. So you could argue that, and there's a guy named Thierry de Chardin, who's a philosopher who talked about the noosphere, the objective content of thoughts. Well, that's Wikipedia and Google search results and Wolfram and all these other things that we can now use to go and understand the world. But we've never really been able to chat with us, us, this collective that we have created. And I know I sound like some weird hippie and you're welcome to join my cult, but there is a collective superorganism, and it's made of us. And the best example of this recently is GPT-3. 
So years ago, Google came out with this thing that would auto-complete my sentences. So I remember when I first saw this, I sent my mom a mail saying, hey, this is kind of weird. You know, my email client suggests responses to a mail. And she goes, hilarious, but deeply disturbing. I'm like, all right, mom, you're pretty, pretty sharp. And I said, so true. She goes, now I'll have to guess if this is a computer generated response. At what point can I presume it's a real you answering? Can I presume if it's more than a sentence and it's likely to be a real person? And I reply, I think so. Which is a mean thing to do to your mom. So I also replied, this is me, right? But to me, that was the first time where I was like, hey, mom, you may not be talking to a human. That's unusual. Yeah, yeah. Now, today we have GPT-3 and I played around with the first GPT with version two and it wasn't great. GPT-3 is really creepy good. Like to be clear, uh, GPT-2, which is just a, it's making statistical predictions about language. That's it. It's an algorithm that makes like, statistical predictions about language. GPT-2 was trained on 1.5 billion parameters. Then, you know, Microsoft did the Turing NLG. That was 17 billion. GPT-3 is 175 billion parameters. It's like right. staggering numbers. And the right. results are frighteningly good. GPT-3, like, for example, you can ask it questions and it will give you answers. Even if it doesn't know them, it'll give you nonsense answers. But if you say, hey, GPT-3, if the question is nonsense, tell me it's nonsense. All of a sudden, it's like, okay, I know what nonsense is. So we're no longer writing code and having it produce data. We're writing prompts and data and having it produce code. And that's kind of weird because now, you know, I can get it to diagnose medical conditions. I can get it to write ad copy. I was on a conference last week and like I used this and I basically made the ad tagline for the conference. I'm like, here, I did your free work for you. And the organizers are like, what? Um, I'll give you another example. You can use GPT-3 to make a more complicated explanation of a simple explanation. So if I said, explain how to use a drinking fountain using these terms, GPT-3 yep. comes back with, to activate the mechanized dihydrogen monoxide dispensary service station, use the flanges to provide a downward force. And you're like, oh, that's a neat parlor trick. Oh yeah? How about you're about to sue me and I'm gonna pump all my discovery through this. No, your honor, I complied, but I've made the opposing counsel take 50 times as long to understand what the hell I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty weird, right? No one's done it yet, but it's only a matter of time. And yeah. so when you have the, you know, hey, I'd like to hear Isaac Newton explain gravity to me. Hey, can you summarize movies with emoji? Hey, if I write a block of text describing an app, can you code it for me? These are all real things we've already done. Yeah. And yeah. so that means that the, the algorithms are putting words in our mouths and our fingertips. We're going to see completion. Like I'm familiar with copy and paste when I use word, but what about a button called go? Like Microsoft is the lead sponsor of OpenAI, and they've got an exclusive license to use it in their products. So how soon until Microsoft word, you type a sentence or two hit go and it finishes the document and you go back and edit it. Like I'll have a go button. We don't think about it yet, but mark my words, 10 years from now, you'll have copy, paste, undo and go. Right whatever you want to call it. If you want to call it go, you can pay me some money. Um, but I think that, that, that we have not realized what's going to happen when, and I'm not saying AI is a superpower, right? Like AlphaGo is just as bad at Jeopardy as Watson is at playing, driving cars, as Tesla is at playing Go. They're, they're not superhuman. All they're doing is understanding the statistics of language. But here's the real mind fuck, pardon my French. All you're doing is understanding the statistics of language because that's technology. That's and right. if that's the case, right? If that's the case, we're a collective species as humans. Yeah. We've had to settle for anecdotes and printed words and imperfect connections. And now I can slide into someone's inbox almost anywhere in the world. Anybody can get that information. And the algorithm can start talking to me, putting words in my mouth, which means that I'm gonna become more sane. No kidding, we're having an epistemic crisis we're, being, we're building things that make the value of the individual go way down, not allowing them to express themselves, and then moving them towards a world where they're cogs in a machine they can't possibly understand. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it really is kind of scary. I, um, I'm reminded of uh, something, and I, I wish I could remember the author I didn't, and, and more of the content, but I read it uh, years ago about um, a human ability to determine what was coming next in most songs and how that relates to what you're describing relative to what um, 
uh, you know, analytics are doing to words and phrases. Yeah, so. Bobby McFerrin doing that thing where he's on the stage and he jan he dances notes and everybody knows what the next note is because they've understood the frequencies. We're yeah. pattern matching machines. We evolved to not piss off the tribal leader so we got a piece of flesh. Like that's kind of how we evolved, right? And we are running around with jungle surplus wetware, craving approval, getting little jolts of dopamine and serotonin. We got to figure this out. The, the problem here is that the epistemic crisis isn't some cabal, right? Like, every, oh, yeah, maybe it's a plot by this party or that party or, I don't know, Hugo Chavez. No, we are the plot. We're the ones that want these systems. We're the ones that look at the stuff that fills our, you know, I see algorithms with nonsense in them. Why am I not getting suggestions for amazing science videos? There's a ton of them, but that's not what I choose to watch. We are our own captors here. And that's what's weird is a lot of us like it. And that we got to figure out how to, so if you ask yourself what the real problem is, the real problem is like, how do we outlive the dinosaurs? It'd be nice to be around for a hundred million years. That'd be good. And I yeah. can't understand why we don't as a collective species go, Hey, number one political goal, outlive the dinosaurs. After that, let's discuss, but can we agree on that? We can't even agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. It is pretty scary. I, um, uh, had this conversation with um, uh, one of my brothers the other day, and and um, uh, on on a similar topic, and uh, of course we digressed really quickly into the fact that depending on what nation you're from, we're lucky to be able to go a quarter. At least some nations can plan out for 50 years or something, but as a world, um, uh, trying to create a collective reason for how to progress, man, we are so far from that. Well, and and honestly, complex systems suggest that we just can't. Yeah. Um, when you're in a system that's simple and controlled, you can understand it. You can figure out cause and effect, you know, Newtonian approaches. But there's right. very good evidence that complexity theory suggests mm -hmm. that doesn't ever work. There's always outliers, right? Um, when you compress an MP, uh, a, a piece of pure audio, analog audio, to an MP3, you lose something. And those losses, that noise, is actually the thing that, that provides the uncertainty in the universe that makes the universe non-deterministic. And, and that noise, noise exists at every level of consciousness. Yeah. And the, uh, here's a good example. NVIDIA came out with something recently where they were compressing video very, very efficiently. So it would send a photo of my face and then it would send deformations of key points of my face. And the result was like going from 97 kilobytes per frame to 0.11 kilobytes per frame. Like that's a pretty staggering amount of compression. But if I bring my cup on screen, it doesn't know, how to, all of a sudden compression goes down, right? If a dog jumps in, if I look sad, maybe all of its training videos were people looking happy, looking happy in business meetings and it doesn't do right. sad very well. It seems to me like any kind of compression, uh, even human memory works this way. Uh, does does follows kind of a Pareto curve, right? You remember the obvious things. Uh, I was watching a Spolsky uh, talk the other day. This is astonishing. So in Western cultures, we tend to think of colors as red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Yep. And we will recognize something orange more than something that's half orange, half yellow, because we know it's orange. There are other cultures where they divide up the color spectrum differently. And those cultures will remember the colors that they've, the categories of colors they've created, but won't notice orange. So this idea that somehow our mind is just different from our body, like that's me not noticing a color, right? Yeah. As we start to choose what to categorize, choose what to compress, as the algorithms chunk things, chunk us into political groups, whatever, we are going to start noticing those things more and that becomes self-reinforcing. And so the reality is I think that, that humanity is what's lost in compression, right? We're the part that the algorithm doesn't summarize well. Yeah. And that's where black swans come from. Uh, the, realistically, if you look at knowledge and learning, we learn in two ways. We learn in a normative way, which is like, I read a book, I follow the common wisdom, I was taught by my parents, that's normative wisdom. And when you train an algorithm like GPT-3, you train it at a moment in time and it learns from all the internet and it builds billions of parameters at that moment in time. If a day later something remarkable happens, it won't know anything about it. Right. And by the way, the cost to train the model, $4.6 million of power. It's pretty expensive. 
I think that humans are the other kind of learning, what's called formative learning, which is the new learning, what's now possible, what seemed unwise according to the old axioms, but is now true. We stupid humans tilt at windmills, we run up hills, we do foolish shit, we start startups with no basis in truth that nobody else would start. But we do it because that's where advantage lies, right? In figuring out that the old folklore is no longer true, that the doors that were closed can now be opened. And I think that humans, like our role as humans, is that we can't solve collective problems, either with individual solutions, our own solutions, or um, using traditional known models because they just don't exist. So we need new ways to find out what's true and we need to figure out how to live in equilibrium with this superorganism that we have become, this sort of human machine hybrid. I'm hopeful that we'll get there, but I think the next 10 or 15 years of law and ethics and like, if you think of the number of scammers that took advantage of print media or broadcast media, yeah. the next 10 or 15 years is gonna be very weird. And we're either going to go back to the caves uh, and realize we hate each other and everybody's gonna put up national borders, uh, or we're going to make it through and sacrifice some of our individuality. But hopefully we do so in a way that recognizes that humans are a necessary part of this normative, formative sort of progress. Right, right. It's it's ironic that a, a lot of what we're saying or what you're saying here takes you back to that old saying of familiarity bring, breeds contempt, right? I mean, it's- That uh, was the, the, I think it was the very naked ladies that said, absence makes the heart grow, grow fungus. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, what I find fascinating, I remember early, my father was a PhD DSC in parasitology and he died pretty young, but I remember one of my conversations with him, I said, why do they call it a PhD? Like you're a parasitologist, not a philosopher. And he goes, Alistair, when you get far enough up in something, it's all philosophy. And I mean, this really is philosophy, the nature of truth, um, what it, you know, where we draw a line between individual and collective, what is the difference between digital and analog self? Like these are very serious epistemic uh, conversations to have. My biggest concern, I think, behind all this is that we have failed the, the next generations by not giving them the cognitive tools to be able to work through this stuff without a lot of guns and explosions. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as we, as we come towards the end of, of um, the session, um, I... I, I God, I, I just so many ways I'd like to tear this open and, and talk about it um, uh, uh, from new angles. But, you know, if we if we had to pick two or three things to think about as far as uh, how we educate, how we drive value into, I mean, because I'm, I'm all over the place now because you've put so many things in my head. I apologize to the audience. But like a recent conversation I had with a bunch of other tech weenies on um uh, uh, Rob Hirschfeld's Cloud um, 2030 talks that uh, he organizes for all of us every Thursday. If you're interested, it's every Thursday at eight o'clock. Uh, and if you don't have a link, let me know. I'll find one for you. Um, but you know, one of the topics that we discuss in there on a regular basis is how do we um, give people both the mechanism and the, the interest in controlling their own self relative to this new digital world and what to give away, what not to give away and what to, what to do under certain circumstances and, and what to expect in return. And um, uh, there are a lot of smart people that participate in this and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of good answers. So um, that's absolutely true. And um, I think that there are some promising examples of this. The Carnegie Foundation is doing some work with Taiwan around how they manage disinformation and stuff. Um, I think if I had to give like a curriculum that I would love to see taught, the first is we need to talk about objective functions. The objective function of an algorithm is what you're training it to do, right? Whether that's make paper clips or spell check or whatever. So Cory Doctorow says that um, modern science fiction is a mirror onto our current concerns, not necessarily a projection of the future. And so when you see science fiction about AI, like the matrix, it's actually talking about um, corporations, mindless, big corporations that we are just a cog in a machine for. I think that that's a very valid concern and we need to teach people about the objective function. In Germany, the constitution says that the market is in service of the society. Yeah. I don't think we have that recognition. No. And in many cases, society is in service of the market. GDP is king and so on, right? Um, so until we say, what's the objective function of this company? 
What's the objective function of this algorithm? What's the objective function of this law? What does it want to happen? Uh, we don't really think about these things well. So the first thing is I'd train that and sort of critical thinking around the objective mm -hmm. function. Second thing is we've got to find a common ground truth. That means implementing transparency in public policies. That means businesses being very transparent about what they do, their carbon outputs, whatever, and people, you know, them being open to inspection. Uh, sunlight's a great disinfectant. And I think, uh, I hope that we are going to see massive demand from citizens on transparency, transparency around carbon footprint impact, about data privacy and so on. And the problem is that that transparency, like the data is hard to parse. So there's got to be trusted third parties who are brokers who say, hey, you know, here's a simple summarization of this. These are the exceptions you should be aware of. Yeah. Um, I think that we're going to wind up having to redraw the lines between public and private sector. This is something, and I've been doing a lot of work with digital government lately. We're fine with a government building a highway. We're not okay with it building broadband. And yet I think most people would say, I'd rather have workable broadband to be a digital citizen than I'd like my highway paved, right? So we have to rethink where the line is between public and private, because there are certain functions that a digital citizen needs that, a, that an analog citizen didn't. And we have, because of capitalism and so on, been unwilling to cede some of those to the public sector where they belong. Yeah. And as a result, we've enacted rent taking and taxes from the private sector on functions that government needs. And then lastly, I would say we need a digital bill of rights. Uh, there's been there's been attempts to make this happen. But I think, and I said this a few years ago at OSCON, um, within a few years, we are going to have a digital log of our life. Uh, today, it already exists, right? Mark, if I had the right passwords, I could find out your vaccination history, your medical history, your tax history, any parking or driving tickets you've had, your school. These are all things that exist. There's also all your photos on Facebook, pictures of us at Interop and in Vegas or whatever. Or my shop. Yeah. Tons of stuff, right? That stuff's spread all over the place, but you should own it. And I would like to say that the first rule of a digital bill of rights should be nobody should know more about me than I do. I'm okay with you knowing as much as me about me in a particular field, because maybe I've been trusted, but you sh nobody should know more than me about me. Right. And if you build on that, if you say, look, we're going to teach people how to think critically about the objective function, even training what that means. We're going to increase transparency and accountability in easy consumable ways to rebuild trust. We're going to redraw the lines of the public and the private sector to reflect the needs and rights of a digital citizen. And then we're going to put systems together that let you, Mark, scroll through your life, see it in context, have an algorithm that's working on your behalf, crunch through it and make recommendations that nobody can know more about you than you do because right. that data is you. If we can achieve those four things, uh, like if I were running for office, those are that would be my platform. And I'd never win because I'm not enough like a reality show star, but I do think there's hope if the leaders of the world decide to get their act together. So, Alistair, uh, you know, you've um, you mentioned at the top of the um, podcast that you'd written a couple of books. And um, speaking for myself, I can say to the audience that uh, I appreciated the content, even though some of that was very um, new to me at the time. Um, I'd like for you to just give the audience a quick spiel on those books again, because I think uh, for almost anyone, even folks that have have played in these areas that we've discussed, including lean analytics and, and better use of data. Um, I think that there's an opportunity uh, in both of them if you'd give the audience a quick synopsis. Sure, and I'm gonna bogart the question too. Uh, so I wrote a book called Lean Analytics. Uh, the idea about lean analytics is that um, you should find one metric that matters. That metric is dictated by the kind of business model you're in and the stage you're at. So you might be early stage where you're trying to get empathy and stickiness for a product or later stages where in revenue and scale. And your business model might be something that's transactional, like a marketplace or e-commerce. It might be a subscription business. It might be um, something that's based on ad clicks or media or user generated content. If you know the stage and you know the, um, the business model, you can probably tell what metric you should be trying to uh, tackle, whether that's churn or conversion rate or whatever. And you should know what's good enough, like what's the market norm for that. And then you got to be very diligent about running a series of iterative experiments to get there. That's the whole book. You don't need to read it now. Two things came out of it. The first um, is that large organizations struggle to deal with innovation because they do not think about their innovation projects as a portfolio. So I'm a strong proponent 
that there is different kinds of innovation. And this is not me saying it, but I've kind of gone across the literature and looked at Clay Christensen and various other authors that talk about, you know, the three horizons and so on. And it seems to me that there is sustaining evolution, uh, sorry, sustaining innovation, which is just do more of the same better. There's adjacent innovation where you change either the product or the market or the go-to-market method. There's disruptive innovation where you knowingly destroy the incumbent or the cash cow in order to reinvent. And then there's discontinuous innovation where the world is different. So I'll give you a concrete example. Um, sustained, sustaining innovation is next year's Mercedes Benz has more cup holders and a darker black. That's more of the same, right? Adjacent innovation is Mercedes is now selling online or um, Mercedes now sells an electric car, right? I've changed the method or the product or whatever. Right. Um, a disruptive innovation is Mercedes owns car to go. The more people use car to go, the fewer people buy Mercedes. And in fact, Mercedes does own car to go. And discontinuous innovation is the electric car. We don't know what life will be like, but it's likely my daughter is going to ask me, when did you shave? You know, don't you need to do that in the car? How do you handle the conference, the morning conference call if you had to drive? They right. let you drive? That's incredibly unsafe, right? Yep, yep. And I think that companies need to manage a portfolio of innovation. So one of the things that's a project out of this, um, which will probably become a book, is on enterprise portfolio management for innovation, and it'll be called Tilt the Windmill. Nice. The second thing that I found is that all of these plans, as soon as somebody does them, they become obsolete. Andrew yeah. Chen has something he calls the law of shitty click-through rates. Head of growth at Uber, now head of growth at Andreessen Horowitz. Basically, all platforms and all ad campaigns devolve over time. Your job, if you are a marketer, is not to create more information, which simply goes into the already massive over glut of information we have. It is to create attention that you can turn into profitable demand. So when Farmville showed up, Farmville um, found a way to build an app that sent messages to your friends' feeds in Facebook. And they were like, oh, we found a vulnerability. Now, you and I would call that a hacker, right? That's an exploit. Right. And then Facebook patched the exploit. You can't do that anymore. And Farmville had 30 million customers. That door had closed. And so I think that most great companies need to spend at least half their time. Because when I talk to startup founders, they'll tell me all about their product. They won't tell me anything about their go-to-market strategy. Yeah. Those companies need to spend at least half their time um, creating attention, subverting a system in a way that creates attention they can turn into profitable demand. Right. And uh, now that you see the world that way, I've spent the last three or four years collecting anecdotes about this. Um, I'm writing a book with my friend, Emily Ross. She lives in Ireland, another very subversive marketing person. But <laughs> the book's going to be called Just Evil Enough. And people are like, but you shouldn't actually be evil. I'm like, no, but I got to call it that so that you pay attention, which is in itself a hack. Yep. I don't think we're being subversive enough in marketing. And I want this to happen because I want us to subvert existing systems. I want us to think subversively. Subversive just means another version. Right. And I think the solutions we have today for all the problems we just discussed about ep epistemic uh, crises and democracy and solving climate change and all this stuff, they, we're not going to solve them with the, the existing systems. We're going to solve them with new ones. So let's hey humans let's start thinking a little more subversively let's be a little bit evil not totally evil but evil enough to find a new way to get the system to behave to our advantage yeah yeah i, I like that actually i like the um idea especially around marketing um the traditional method is to to basically make the original balloon just bigger and that doesn't necessarily right. convert to new sales um, i want a drone i don't want a new, another balloon um, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's the first time I mentioned it. So I think Emily, Emily and I are about to take the covers off the website and announce that it's coming and nice. we've been working on it for a bit. I've done the talks on it for a couple of years now. Uh, and it, that's usually how I get sort of books together. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm writing a book on subversive go-to-market strategies with Emily Ross. Awesome. Well, Alistair, I can't believe how good it's been to just catch up with you again. It's been way too long. You too. I, know, I did all the talking. I want to hear what you're up to too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, actually, if you want to just stay on a few minutes afterwards sure. to, to catch up, um, that'd be great. Um, and for those of you listening in, uh, Alistair, where do people find you if they want to find uh, you? Anywhere? I'm a Kroll on most places. Uh, so Twitter at a Kroll. And I have a Substack where I mail things occasionally, uh, a Kroll .substack .com. Uh, There's leananalyticsbook.com, solveforinteresting.com, too many.coms. Uh, I would say just evil enough.com is about to be a very interesting place. Uh, we have some. We ought to eat our own uh, eat our own dog food, so there'll be some subversiveness in how we promote that book that we're very excited to take the covers off. 
Nice. Well, uh, really appreciate you coming on the program. And um, as I expected, uh, you expanded my mind and thinking considerably as usual. So oh, I really appreciate that. And um, I look forward to the next time. So thank you. For sure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Edgevana podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening app or on YouTube. To learn more, visit www.edgevana.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to join us on our next episode.